Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going to start with uh, a few announcements, which are the following. One that uh, today, 8 p.m. Madrid time, which is 2 p.m. Uh, US uh, East Coast time, we have a flamenco concert for, from a very good flamenco singer who is mm. going to, to sing these songs that are sung uh, in, during Easter to the Virgin or to the Christ or to the different processions in Seville. If someone has gone to Seville, uh, you will oh. know. Uh, but it's a kind of kirtan, it's a devotional song. It has a lot to do with Hindu music because flamenco is linked to gypsy music, which at the same time is linked uh, with the northern of India. So you will find similarities. Uh, one of the songs, which is very, very nice, the letter, we have translated it into English and we will put the translation as subtitles as the song is going. So I advise you to be there in the flamenco concert this, this uh, afternoon, evening in Spain. Uh, also about the auction, as you know, like in every international course, we are having an auction. Uh, uh, the funds uh, that we get from the auction will go to continue the development of this platform and putting the, the satsangs and videos available to teachers for them to include them in their courses, etc. Ramón, and, uh, per, per, perdona, recuerda que estás hablando solamente tú, que no hay traductor de momento. Ah, uh, okay. So I am speaking in English without an interpreter. Why don't you put an interpreter? Ahora <laughs> Yo puedo, puedo hacerlo, si queréis. Le damos ya. Okay, okay. So now uh, I will. <laughs> okay, but now I. Sí, puedes interpretar tú. No, no, pero yo no voy a interpretar. Yo voy a hablar en inglés. Tienes que elegir. Sí, yo me pone aquí a elegir, pero yo no quiero elegir. Espera. Yo ahora estoy hablando en inglés. A ver, perdonad, Ramón, hmm. tienes que comentarlo en castellano y en inglés, perdona, porque tú también eres eh, in, intérprete del eh, castellano al inglés. Por eso cuando ya no te, ya hagas, hayas hecho los ah, comentarios... Coño, yo pensé que me habíais puesto... Bueno, vale. So, anyhow, I will continue in English and then I will say it in Spanish. Uh, so the auction, if you have any items that you want to share for the auction, just contact uh, someone that you may know of the people that are around the organization of this in the US, Emma or Irma or Maria de Angelis, in Spain, Sergio or myself. Uh, or uh, yeah, Sergio, most of you, or the event organization committee email, which uh, is read by many people. And you just send a picture of it, you know, if it's a painting, a picture of the painting, if it's whatever it is, a picture. And the last Saturday, we will hold this auction. Uh, also, if... Uh, uh, we appreciate your donations in the platform. You have a tab that says donations. If you want to make a donation, you are welcome. And last but not least, uh, let me introduce you to Rupa and Sujay. Uh, most of the English speaking people will know them. Uh, so I will not uh, extend myself in their presentation and I'll just switch into Spanish. Bueno, en español, eh, recordaros que tenemos a las 8 el concierto de flamenco, eh, que los que tengáis cosas para la subasta, eh, mandar una foto o a Sergio o a mí por email para que las vayamos subiendo a la plataforma porque el último día tendremos la subasta eh, y, y necesitamos recaudar donaciones con la subasta 
para mantener la actividad. Eh, también tenéis un botón para hacer donaciones en la misma plataforma, que sois bienvenidos a hacerlas. Y os voy a presentar a Rupa y a Sujay, que van a dar el satsang de hoy. Los dos eh, son estudiantes y discípulos de Guru Raj desde el año 1976 y estuvieron con él durante todo el tiempo que estuvo enseñando. Eh, por lo tanto, los dos eh, pueden trasladaros una experiencia directa de estas enseñanzas. Eh, los dos son practicantes de estas enseñanzas y, y bueno, pues eh, espero y estoy seguro de que disfrutaréis un montón de ellos y recordaros que ahora aparecerá el botón de, de lengua en la que queréis oír. Remind you that you will now get a button with the language you want to listen. Eh, eh, si es inglés, en inglés. Si es español, en español. If it is English, in English. If it is Spanish, Spanish. Just press the button. And uh, I pass now uh, the word to Rupa. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we're going to start by listening to this absolutely awesome satsang, which is called The Purpose of Unreality. It's The number of it is US 8638. Mm -hmm. And um, before we begin the satsang, um, I want you to know that... Um, Uh, both Sujay and I were there. I didn't know when I picked it. I forgot that we actually asked two of the questions, but there are four questions that are asked in this satsang. And because of what happened was, um, I was in charge of putting the questions to Guru Raj. So I gave him one question, right? And, uh, And then he said, hey, it's a short course. Give me a lot more questions. Mm. I want a lot of questions. So uh, mm. there's dialogue and that got cut out of the video that you can get because you didn't want all that dialogue. But what happens is we bring up the other people who had questions. So there's my question, which is uh, uh, why I'll tell you these questions They're there. All right. Question I asked was, uh, help, where is it? Oh, why has unreality superimposed itself upon reality? That was my question. And then he said, let's hear some more questions. So we brought up Chetan. And uh, Chetan had a question and his was, uh, wait a minute, beloved Guruji, What is the true second birth? And then in came two more questions. There was Sujay's question, which I think will be on the tape, though I haven't seen it, but he asks, what is the relationship between feeling But it was my mother who asked, who had this question. My mother's name was uh, Nirmala. Question, can you discuss how the universal energy, which is everywhere and everything, can nevertheless manifest most strongly in an awakened heart? So there were four questions, four people asking them, And in his satsang, I wanted you to know that because he masterfully answers every single question in this satsang. And this satsang, in my opinion, is worth listening to 20 times. It's awesome. And I highly recommend that you listen to the whole thing when you get a chance. We can't play the whole thing. So that's all. And uh, now we'll just do a couple of minutes of meditation and go right into the satsang. Enjoy, okay? Mm.
ओम शांति 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 Okay, Guru Raj, we have four questions. I'm going to ask the questions again, okay, just so you can, because how could you remember them? Here are the four questions. Uh, why has unreality superimposed itself on reality? What is the true second birth? What is the relationship between feeling and intellectuality? How does the universal energy, which is everywhere and everything, nevertheless manifest most strongly in an awakened heart? Those are the four questions. Thank you. So, you have been born many, many a time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> many, many a time. Not meaning a reincarnation that you get born into another life. But in this very lifetime, you have been born many, many a time as your consciousness expands. And when you cognize or recognize greater and greater truths, and with every little realization, you are reborn because the new realization supersedes the older one, and therefore you are a new person, and yet the reality within you remains the same, for that is the only thing, the real self, the real I, that never gets born and never dies, only forms and structure are formed, reformed and even deformed. So the superimposition comes about, and if you would study Hindu mythology, hmm, like Sujay has done, you will find that they say that even this superimposition is but an illusion, or as the Advaitic philosophy rather would say. Shankaracharya lived in the 12th century and he reformulated uh, uh, ancient ideas of thousands of years ago into this Advaitic philosophy, which we term monism, the oneness of all things. So here we come to the point where there is no difference between manifestation and the manifest. The fragrance of the flower is none different from the flower. If you capture the fragrance in a test tube, you will find minute particles of which this flower is composed. So the flower gives of itself, and by this continual giving of itself, the particles of itself gradually, that is how the flower 
ceases to exist in our eyes. But the fragrance, because being so subtle, still continues. You might sprinkle perfume in this room or light incense sticks and you carry them out of this hall. Yet when you come in, the fragrance will still be there. So, even without the manifester, which is none present by your own cognition, although there is no such thing as none presence, but to your mind you would feel that he is not present, but the fragrance is forever present in all the life and all life that we see, feel, touch, smell with our senses. Hmm? So we feel these things with our senses and also within ourselves. Now feeling is the father of emotion. Without feeling there can be no emotion. So, when feelings are well regulated, emotions can be directed. The emotions of love, hate, and the negative ones as well, jealousies and things, they all originate from the feelings you have within you. A lot of them are lying dormant, but that does not mean <coughs> that it is non-existent. So feelings come first before emotions come. The reason being this, that emotions are an outward portrayal of the inner feeling itself. The feeling cannot be portrayed or shown. I might feel great love for you, but if I do not demonstrate it through my emotions and actions, because emotion itself is an action, then that feeling will not be known and not only will it not be known by you, but I will not be giving full expression to that feeling I have. And because of that feeling, we become emotional in a good or a bad way. Now the word emotion is usually associated with negativity, which is wrong. And uh, if you want to deride a person, the person <coughs> does uh, something, uh, you would say he's emotional, over-emotional. No, that is not the case at all. Hmm? You can be sitting in your chapel, in your synagogue, church, temple, and be filled with emotion for the object of your devotion and tears will start streaming through your eyes. There's one sage, Ramakrishna, and I went to visit his shrine in Calcutta, India, and I was in the very room that he lived in, where he ha used to have its, his satsang. It was a small room, could accommodate 30, 40 people at a squeeze. Mm. But the vibrations were so strong mm. there that, I mean, having been an experienced meditator for many years standing and having reached that illumined state at the age of 15, 16, I 
could feel all that. And I was just crying and crying and crying. And I came out of that state a few hours later. Hmm? And I was told by others that were there, but you were just crying and crying and crying. What was happening there? Because my feeling was so great for Ramakrishna and his teachings that I had to spontaneously express itself with tears, emotion. So the feeling was vast. Then came the emotion. Why should feelings be fast? Hmm? Because you are guided by your subtle body, which contains all the feelings you have ever had, and you draw upon them, it gets triggered off by some little happening where it comes into play and contact with the conscious mind. And that is where emotions really begin. <coughs> emotions begin in the conscious mind while feelings begin at a far deeper level, which is the heart, be they good or bad, depending upon the condition of your heart. Hmm? Now, there is a very close connection between emotion and feeling. Hmm? One is connected to the other. So therefore I've said this before, that the mind is connected to the heart. And to which would you give greater dominance, the mind or the heart? Hmm? The mind can become angry, which is also an emotion, without any rhyme or reason. Hmm? And the mind has the ability to transmit in vibrational form its outpourings or expression, not only outwardly but inwardly affecting and corrupting the feelings you have. If you are emotionally angry, your heart also becomes angry. If you are deep in the emotion of worship or of love, your heart also becomes very devotional and very loving. So there is this connection that leads the mind to the heart and the heart to the mind. So, the deeper you can feel the more control you have of feelings. Now by control, I do not mean suppressing feelings, hmm? which in turn will create impressions and inhibitions and the like. Control does not mean that if you want to have a cigarette, and you fight in your mind that I am not going to smoke the cigarette. That is not control. Because the seed of the smoking habit is very deeply implanted in you. Hmm? And if it is so deeply implanted that you cannot control it. It's like a weed growing in your lawn. You cannot control it. And the best you could do is uproot the weeds. By control, I mean developing a attitude which will rid the weeds in your lawn. 
that is the best form of control. You always hear people talking of exercising your willpower. That too is a fallacy. There's no such thing as willpower. Develop a strong will. Yes, you can do it. You will something and you fight for it and you can get it. But you are not going to destroy the essence or the basis or the motivation of that will. It will still remain in seed form to grow again, hmm? to come to the surface again. But if you have, if you use the insecticide, of purification, that weed will not grow again. And there, the mind, the emotional self, becomes automatically controlled, spontaneously controlled, by the deep understanding we develop, by Gnana Yoga, the yoga of wisdom, of knowledge, that your attitude which in turn is related to your emotions will change and that is how your feelings will change. And all of you have experienced this. Mm. Sometimes you might find a person who is a loner, mm, just wants to be alone and does not want to mix with people. Mm. And later, if that person is put in an environment and he or she will freely mix with people so beautifully, there will be a wonderful communication. Now that communication comes spontaneously. Hmm? You cannot communicate by forcing yourself through willpower because the other person will immediately feel that uh, it is false. But people feel that. Hmm? For example, this you have experienced in this past two days, when we are together, the feelings are mostly of love. Hmm? Because even through words or what is happening inside me is love and you really feel that love. Sometimes there's a delayed reaction. Hmm? Sometimes you feel the force almost immediately. Hmm? And feeling the force, you tend to become emotional. You express yourself because your feelings have been stirred with love, and you express it in emotion. Hmm? This morning, one of our meditators, who I love so much, as I love everyone, as you know, I play a fool a lot, you know, this all fun. Why not be the example of fun? Hmm? Why not joke and laugh so that others your own life must be an example of what you teach. If you teach of joy, be joyous. If you teach of laughter, laugh. Hmm? If you teach of love, be love. Otherwise your teachings and doings are of no avail. So I was climbing up the stairs uh, and this lady, I haven't seen her for about two years, uh, and I always welcome everyone to my heart I would embrace and tears just fall down the cheeks. What beautiful feeling. Hmm? And how beautifully expressed through the tears that welled up in her lovely eyes. Hmm? I could see the beauty of a soul through her eyes and feel her beauty at the same time.
So all our senses can be geared to feel the beauty, to sense the beauty, and merge with the beauty. So what remains is love as the positive side of life, and life becomes easy. And as it becomes easier and easier, you're taking new births all the time. There's an old saying that you all know, that a coward dies a thousand deaths because he's filled with fear all the time. Hmm? And I could add on to that by saying, that you are reborn a thousand times in this one lifetime. And that is what man must seek for, very naturally. And this is the purpose of unreality. This is something totally new, Vidya. This is the purpose of unreality. Unreality exists tangibly to you to make you see the reality within you. You go on in life and you say, as in Sanskrit they would say, not this, not this, not this, all the time, until you reach the stage where you say, Ah, all is this, thou art that, Brahmasmi, I am that. Those are the final stages. But in the beginning stages, or wherever you are in your evolutionary orbit, hmm? because you will have, I call it an orbit, because you will have to reach back where you have started, circle. Hmm? You go through all these things and you will find it all around in nature. You know, the moon wanes and waxes, you have the sunrise and the sunset. You have flowers blue, certain flowers blooming in one season and being gone and another flower blooming in another season. So you are composed of all the seasons. I think it was in England somewhere or some other country where someone said to me, uh, Guruji, you're a man of all seasons. I says, no, I'm a man of all reasons. That is how it should be. Mm -hmm. You are of all seasons and yet at the same time of all reasons because you know that it is all the reasons that constitute the unreality of life that makes you realize the reality of life. You will never know reality unless you do not pass the dark phases of unreality. You have to pass through that tunnel, dark tunnel. Hmm? You go to a gold mine. Hmm? The gold is not lying on top of the surface ground. But you got to start digging, digging. I don't know if any of you have been in a mine, a gold mine. I have, because gold is plentifully produced in South Africa and I went on a tour. And 
all the tunnels dug into the coal mine, dark, which have to be artificially lit, and then you chop and chop and chop the rocks from which you extract the pure shining gold. That is life. And finding that pure shining gold is rebirth. Okay, we can stop there. Thank you. Ah, okay. By the way, the whole satsang is so, so rich. It's very hard to stop there. And I highly recommend you listen to some more. Uh, just never mind that phone. That's Panu's phone. Um, okay. So, uh, wait a minute. CJ and I will both have plenty of comments because this has everything in it and it's answering our questions. But I want to point out that every every single question that he was asked has already been answered many times over in what we've heard and it's simply for us to listen to pay attention and i'm sure you have you will find all of it um so jay do you want to go first or do you want to go second uh, it's fine with me, whichever goes for, I can go now, or if you want to go now, you can go. Oh, you're waving me on. Is that what that is? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, when I, I, I thought it would be, I thought I would mention a few things that I experienced directly with Guru Raj, because that's what I like to hear about when other people talk about Guru Raj. Um, and I want to invite everyone, whether you met him in person or not, I want to invite everyone to take a moment right now, and we're going to have a moment of silence, a kind of silent satsang within yourself. And what I want you to look for, for the next minute after we start, is what comes to your heart mind when you ask what was the particular lesson if there was only one or maybe two that I received from my connection with Guru Raj? What was his particular message for me that I needed to hear that I needed him to show me? So we're gonna take a minute and just, I want you to see what that is. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. That was a minute. Uh, keep uh, an awareness of that in your heart. If you have a, you might not need to write it down, but if something came that was in words you're not used to, you could write them down, lest you. You know, in case you want to remember later. I say this because I have to write everything down if I want to remember it 40 seconds later. Uh, anyway, I got an answer that wasn't the one that I thought. Uh, and I have a feeling 
that everybody here got her or his own unique answer. And yet probably they all come down to the same thing mm -hmm. because uh, that's what we are. Anyway, um, I'm sure you'll find that in this satsang, he is speaking to whatever it is you heard. Um, when I first met Guru Raj, that is not when I first met him, but when I finally understood that he was the person I had been looking for all of my life, starting at the age of five, from the, when I was five, I, I had an experience that showed me that there was a teacher that I was to work with for my life. And I started looking when I was five years old, which was hopeless since I lived alone on a farm and did not go to school and didn't know anyone. I didn't meet Guru Raj until I was in my uh, late twenties. So I had been looking for him for about a quarter of a century when I finally met him. And I'd been through many, many teachers and learned many of their teachings, but in the end, I always knew they were not the one. And by the time I met Guru Raj, I was really fed up with Indian master teachers because I'd had a bad experience with one of them. And so I didn't recognize him at first because I projected all of my shit was just pulled in by him. And by the way, this is one of the things a guru does, the, the, the powerful energy of a guru is so compelling, whether you, he's there in the flesh or in your heart, it will pull up out of you the shadows that you haven't faced. And of course your practices do this too, which is the reason that we practice meditation and spiritual practices every day. It's because they show us the places in us that are obscuring our awareness that we don't want to look at, we don't want to face, we don't want to deal with. This part that he was just talking about, the gold mine, that where he says, I'm just going to read it to get the words exactly. You have to pass through that tunnel, <coughs> dark tunnel. Mm -hmm. He says, you will never know reality unless you pass the dark phases of unreality. You have to pass through that tunnel, dark tunnel. You go to a gold mine. The gold is not lying on top of the surface ground. You got to start digging, digging. I don't know if any of you have been in a mine, a gold mine. I have. And all the tunnels dug into the gold mine are dark. They have to be artificially lit. And then you chop and chop and chop rocks from which you extract the pure shining gold. That is life. And finding that pure shining gold <laughs> is rebirth. So there he's answering actually all of our questions, every one of us. He's answering my question about unreality, superimposed on reality. He's answering Chetan's question, what is the second birth? He's answering Sujay's question about the relationship between intellectuality and feeling. And he's answering my mother's question about why are some who have an awakened heart, why do the people with awakened hearts manifest everything more than those who are not yet awakened? Since everything is God all the time, everywhere. By the way, every Every paragraph in this transcript is the transcript I have of it. In other words, every, every few sentences, he is answering the questions. They're all there. They are, the, this satsang is like the bottom of those gold mines. The gold is in there. A little bit of chopping sometimes or else none. Just right there. Everything. For example, the first sentence where he says... I have to get a second pair of glasses to see my first pair. That's what he says, the very first thing. 
because uh, he wants to read the questions, right? And he jokes about American pronunciation. Lost, lost, whatever. Anyway, he says, uh, where are my specs? I need to get a second pair. Where is it? I'll have to buy another pair of specs to find my previous pair. When I first heard it, when it was first said, I just thought he was talking about making a little joke to make us laugh. When I heard it this time, he was answering my question about unreality and reality. Unreality being the second pair of specs and the second pair of specs that we put on, which is unreality, the perception of all of this, the pairs of opposites, the five senses. That's our second pair of specs. And why do we put it on? We being the one. We put on the second pair so we can find the first pair. We can find the non-form. We can find our true nature, which has no form, no senses, no opposites, all opposites, darkness and light combined. So in this hot song, it's all here in almost every sentence. Mm -hmm. It's there. Okay. So, um, and then, um, and then what he says, the next sentence, he says, why has unreality superimposed itself upon reality? That was the first question, the one that I asked him. And he answers it in one, one sentence, answers it. He says, the answer is very simple because it is the nature of that reality, the manifester, to be manifested. Simple. It's just the nature. And then he goes on, right? He talks about the flower giving off fragrance without even knowing it. He talks about the incense stick. And again, in the incense stick analogy, he shows us what, he, what our life is. He says, it's a bunch of cow dung rolled up and perfumed with different perfumes that then burns itself up. I don't know if you ever heard a, a satsang he gave from California where he said the whole universe is made up of tiny particles made of shit. He called them shitrons. And he said, the scientists have to discover the true nature beyond the protons and the, all those other ones, the shitrons, meaning it's an unreal universe. And so it's shit. And yet that's what the universe is. And it's a fragrance. It's all the fragrances we put into the incense stick and then we burn it. And as it burns, it gives off the fragrance and it burns itself out. But then he points out, reality never burns itself out, but it has fun burning itself off as incense, right? That's unreality having, being the delightful expression of love, of reality. Anyway, like that, I'm not going to, but I could go through this whole satsang like that. Every, every third sentence, if not every sentence, you would see him answering all of the questions in those sentences and answering them in ways that it might take a long time for us to discern. The first thing, anyway, so it took me a long time even to get that the person I'd been looking for all my life, that I'd been promised that there would be this teacher. It took me a year and a half after I met him and actually three years after I first heard of him, before I understood, oh my God. And it only happened because I decided he was full of shit and he was a, another stupid Indian guru and I was gonna leave him. And um, I wrote him a note that morning and said, I was on a course and I said, uh, no, I went to see him, that's it. I saw him. The only way I could see him was to go to a tea. So I went to this tea we all sat around with little cups of tea, like six of us. And I figured this is the only chance I'm gonna to have to talk to this person because he would not let me see him personally. He let 300 other people literally see him personally and he wouldn't let me see him. So the only way I could get in to talk to him was to go to a tea that was arranged by Gita, who was the first, one of the first people who ran everything. So while we were sipping tea and being very formal and polite, I told him I was leaving him. 
and I w- had come to say goodbye because he wasn't, mm-hmm. I thought he was my teacher, but I didn't need a teacher. All was my teacher. My teacher was everywhere. And I'm telling you this story because I think it's fun to hear stories about the guru. Some of you have heard this. So I apologize for those who heard it already. Anyway, so we're sitting there sipping these little cups of tea that were very dainty porcelain things that British, that in a British style, but we were in America, that Gita had put together. And we were all very stiff and formal because it was early, the first, one of the first times he was ever in America. And, uh, <clears throat> and everybody's being polite. And I say to him, I'm leaving. And here's what happened. This is amazing. There were like seven of us in the room, Guruaj and six others. We were distanced by many feet, 12, 10, us. And I heard him say something, but his mouth didn't move. But I clearly heard his voice, absolutely as clear as anything. But his mouth didn't move. And this this took me by surprise, right? One of my first surprises. Right after I said to him I was leaving because I had understood that I'd been looking for a guru all my life and I didn't need to because the guru was in me and everything that I saw would be my guru. And I had just come to the tea to say goodbye to him, to say thank you and I'm leaving. Um, By the way, I tried to leave him three times while I was with him. I was with him for 12 years from the beginning, from his very first talk to his very last talk. And I tried three times to leave. And each time I went and told him I was leaving and forget it, then he would do something else and then I wouldn't leave. (laughs) But anyway, this was the first time I tried to leave. And you know, let me just say, I was a normal, regular human being in this way, as we all are. When it starts getting really deep and we start getting drawn into the deep dark tunnel where the gold is, which is what the guru's function is. Uh, All of the human parts of us say, get me out of here. I am leaving, this is not right. I got to go someplace else, this is not right. This is not right, I'm going somewhere else. I'm not gonna do my practices. Um, They're really a waste of time, Um, they're not working. And I'm gonna, I can do this myself. I don't need all that shit, I'm out of here. What a Anyway, so I didn't know it, but I was just having a normal human moment there. (laughs) Anyway, so I said to him in the middle of this stiff, Mm. polite bunch of seven of us sitting there sipping tea, Mm. like little British people from our little cups, Mm. I said I was leaving. And the next thing that happened was as he looked at me without moving his face, he said, do you want to remain lost forever but his mouth didn't move and I tell you this story because if you whenever not if but whenever you think maybe you might walk away from a difficult part and it feels like you want to get up and leave I want you to know that if Guru Raj were in front of you He would be saying to you without moving his lips, but very clearly, (laughs) do you want to remain lost forever? That was the first thing. Needless to say, by the time that day was over, I was back and I knew that he was the one I'd been looking for. I had the experience of it. And I went, I wrote him a note and said, let me know if you ever need anything and I will find it for you if I can. At which point I received a summons to come and see him personally, which I'd been trying to do for a year and a half and been refused. Now, I guess he thought I was ready. So I went to his room and he came out to meet me and he threw his arms around me and he said, and then he pulled back and he said, I cannot believe what a fool you are. Okay. So these are the great words from the great teacher to me. I can't believe what a fool you are. And of course he was right. Then we go into his room and the first thing he does is offer me a cigarette. And I was a very pure person who had given up smoking seven years earlier so that I could be divine. And I didn't know he smoked. I was shocked. I didn't know he drank or smoked because they hid that in the beginning. And he pulls out a Peter Stuyvesant and offers it to me. My mouth just fell to the ground. 
I was like, well, what? I couldn't, because I knew now that he was it. And it was offering me a cigarette. What? Anyway, um, when I finally recovered and could shut my mouth, um, he said to me, when you're human, be human. And I am still learning that lesson. That was, I can't remember how many years ago, uh, whatever, really long time ago. I have no idea how long ago, you know, at the very beginning. And I'm still learning. When you're human, be human. And so I want to say to you this, whatever lessons you have received or are receiving now from Guru Raj, from Priyatam, from that, they never stop growing. I think of them as one of the ways I think of them is like, I heard that, I heard that olive trees, you guys in Spain will know this better. I heard that olive trees are only really giving off the good olives for the olive oil when they're a hundred years old. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I heard. And um, the, the seeds, that Guru Raj plants in your heart, in our hearts, are like the olive trees. They grow and mature as you have all experienced, every one of you. Whatever you got, you keep watering it and it keeps growing richer and richer. That's why now when I hear this thought song, every sentence leaps out at me with the full truth of what the guru came to teach. And I would just say this, he, he said to me, the second time I tried to leave him, I think it was the second time, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things he said to me was, the duty of a guru is to put the little eye together with the big eye. And when, he has, when that has happened in the cella, the, the big eye and the little eye have come together. The guru's duty is fulfilled. He said this to all of us, by the way. I'm sure you heard it in some of your thought songs. He said, when the big eye and the little eye have connected in the cella, so the cella is awake to that, then the duty of the guru is complete and you can throw the guru away like a used grocery list. And then as you all know, he added later, actually the truth is you don't really throw away the guru you become the guru. There is no separation. Uh, so it's not that you throw him away. It's just, there's no need anymore because you and that, you have realized that you are that. Okay. I could of course go on forever, but I think it would be nice to hear Sujay. And Suj, if you would like to talk, for some reason, I don't see your face. Where did you go, Suj? Sujay, I don't see you. Where are you? Would you wave? Huh, where'd he go? Oh, you must be on page two or something. Oh, there you are. Okay, I see you now. Okay. Why don't you uh, say something, Mr. Sujay? Okay. Uh, thanks, Rupa. That was great. I, it, 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 it reminded me of a, of a few things. I was sitting here musing and kind of uh, thinking back of you know, where I met Guru Raj and how did I meet him? Why did I meet him? And, and a certain series of what I would call unlikely events. When I say that, I mean things that I didn't plan for, had no idea about that seemed to kind of unfold by themselves. And it's only much later, um, looking backward is, is 2020 hindsight usually is. Do, do I understand what was going on? And I remember as a young child, oh, even five, six years old, like Rupa said, I just never felt comfortable with this world. I, 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 I it was like I was, misplaced. I was, I was put somewhere where I didn't really belong. I didn't fit. And I kept looking, physically looking for the door, the, 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 
the the mechanism where I could I could get back to where I was supposed to be. And I, I did this at age five or six, I guess. And again, at the age of maybe 13, when I was in the desert in Las Vegas, I would be walking in the desert by myself. It was very prophetic. Um, and I would be looking in this dry wash on the walls for the lever, for the, for the door, for the doorknob that would let me go where I was supposed to be and, and not here. Always had this, this, this kind of uncomfortable feeling that something was missing. Something was essentially not as it, as it should be. And when I was in Vietnam, it, it, it became even more striking, you know, because the contrasts were so dramatic. The, right. You know, it, it, was, it was very strident, like hitting symbols together where you can't ignore, you know, the, the noise. And I kept saying that there, there's something not right here. Something, something is amiss. I tried to read philosophy, that didn't help, and um, somehow or another when I got back to the States and I got discharged, I, I got into TM, not because I wanted to, but because my friend's mother, who was a TM teacher, uh, sat me down one day and said, I want you to do what I tell you to do, shut up. And when we're finished, you can ask questions because she, she knew I was strung out both from school and from work and, you know, flashbacks to Vietnam and her name was Della. I never forget her, like my second mother. And that, that opened up a, a, a door, which I didn't know existed because before then, when I would close my eyes, everything was like a black wall. And then, all of a sudden, when I started to meditate, I would see this little pinpoint of light, openness, if you will, not light per se, but openness in this black wall. And as time went by, this opening expanded a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And then in 1976, I guess it was, early 76, um, a friend of ours who we taught TM learned Guru Raj's techniques. He was just on the kind of on the horizon. He was in England and this one person who was teaching and, and Vidya and I were TM teachers, you know, and, you know, I had my up to my, I think it was my fifth technique in TM. I mean, there were seven or some ridiculous thing like that. And I had gone through number five. So I was, you know, we got Vidya and I had both gone to Maharishi International University. We'd gone through courses in the science of creative intelligence, and we not only taught TM, but we taught, you know, a lot of those advanced practices. And, and yet, and yet, with all of that and the intellect, there was something missing. But it wasn't, it wasn't as earlier, like, completely missing, but it was like, there's something in the heart that didn't, that was, was, was closed, was empty, was, was not, was not, I don't know what word is, it was, it was not open. And the friend of ours said, hey, I just heard about this guy called Guru Raj, who, who gives personalized techniques. And Midya and I talked about it and we said, okay, let's give it a shot. What do we got to lose? You know, the, he sounds pretty good, you know. I mean, if it doesn't work out, we can always go back to teaching TM and doing what we've been doing for nine years. Well, anyway, so a friend of ours, David East, who was a lawyer, flew out to Chicago on business, but took time from his business dealings and drove to where we lived in Kankakee, Illinois, and um, taught us a prep technique. Well, that was very interesting because even doing the, the prep technique, all of a sudden there was another dimension 
that begin to vibrate, begin to open. And I, it's hard to put into words because this stuff is so, so subtle, so insubstantial from the point of view of the intellect and mind, but so real from yet another level of our, of our awareness, of our being. And it was something that began to vibrate, began to open, that had nothing to do with the intellect, had nothing to do with the outer world or learning things or, you know, even the concept of expanding consciousness, nothing like that. It was something ever, ever so much more delicate, but yet something that hit the core of the heart like a gong, at least for me, it hit a tone. And I go, this is pretty good. This seems to work. So, you know, our forms were sent off and to Guru Raj. And three months later, our full techniques came in, but there was no teacher in our area. And I, I had to fly my, myself, my mother, my wife, and my two babies, little girls, all the way to Las Vegas from, from Illinois in order to get our full techniques. Now, some people grouse and moan about just driving 15 minutes or half an hour to a teacher's house where they can get their full techniques. Well, I want to tell you, I flew my entire family several thousand miles so we could get our full techniques. So, you know, it, it, it's like, what is your commitment? Is your commitment that one of convenience or is it something that is more important to you than a glass of water on a hot day in the desert when you're thirsty. You know, it's, it's that kind of commitment that is, that is needed. But I didn't think anything of it. It didn't seem extraordinary to me or unusual. It's just, this is what we do. So we got our full techniques. And then just look at the series of events, at least for me. That started off where disconnected from life, dis disconnected from this world through, through traumatic situations where something had to give. You know, the, the, the status quo couldn't be maintained anymore. To the beginnings of an opening. To all of a sudden this tone that now hit much deeper. And then all of a sudden one day, this knock on the door in the middle of the cornfields of Illinois. And uh, Gomila knows this pretty well. Um, and this, I open the door and here's this little brown guy in a suit and a tie. And uh, the two people, Amrit and Gita, standing in back of him. And I go, oh shit, that's Guru Raj. And like, so the, 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 I guess you could say the magical thing about this is, is when, when within the depths of your heart, there is, there is an unfulfilled something that demands to be filled. There is a yearning that is not ever put into words, even thoughts, but is constantly felt in this, this outward surge of, of, disconnection, trying to find where the connection is. When that is fundamentally there, the guru appears. You don't have to go looking for him. The right, the right key for your lock will simply show up and show up at your doorstep. And all you've got to do is just let him in. And, and that letting him in is in a certain sense, maybe a little bit of surrender, maybe a little giving up of, I've got it all nailed down, a little giving up of the fact that I need help, a little bit of humility. It, it's these things that are not necessarily thought about, but are deep within you that, that reverberate and broadcast, if you will, out to the universe. And when it's really strong and it's really, it's really your, your call, your yearning 
to the universe for that that completion, it shows up at your doorstep unfailingly, unfailingly. And I remember we were going to the first course in Santa Barbara with Guru Raj. We flew with him on the airplane from Chicago to LA. And I was sitting next to him and for whatever reason, he, he holds my hand for most of the flight to Los Angeles, several hours. And I, I just closed my eyes and I, and, uh, I had no, I didn't think of anything in particular at the time, but there, there was, there was this connection that was being forged, little did I know, and a, a, a connection more deep than I, there, I can put into words. And when we got there, we went to the course and I, uh, I remember I was sitting on the registrar's desk at the University of Santa Barbara in the, in the atrium where the registrar's desk was. And I was just sitting there enjoying the day, just letting my heels click on the wood in back of the, you know, on the, on the big open desk. And all of a sudden, Guru Raj comes out of this little side room. Oh, oh that's interesting. I'm just sitting there, not minding my own business. And he calls me over. He says, come here. I said, okay. So I, you know, what do I know? I he called me over and I went over and he said, I want you to stand here. And then all of a sudden he goes through this big elaborate initiation ceremony. You know, the whole prayer, the, the flowers, the candle, the incense, the whole thing. And then he said, and then he asked me what my mantra was. And to me saying your mantra is a no, no. You know, it's like, ah, I just, I, even then I resisted, but I did tell it to him. And I remember him saying it four or five times. And then he had me say it, I, you know, four or five times. And then he, you know, I was sitting down and I remember him putting his hands on top of my head. And he says, I confer upon you the name Sujay. This was in my first course. And I mean, I didn't want a spiritual time. I didn't, I didn't care less. And I mean, it, it was a non-issue for me. I just, it was just something that never was anything. Um, but, but when I look back, when I look back, that, that moment was, was the major turning point for me in life, where the the lostness, the disconnection, the 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 yearning had a point of reference. Now, it had a like a target. It had a it had a it, there was it was not an unknown as it was before. Something had opened that was not anything you could touch with the mind or even thought or emotions, but something so, so delicate, but yet so at the core of what we are. When that, when that opened up, it was like, I don't know. It was like a, a light shining in a dark room. And it felt, for the first time in my life, I felt comfortable. I felt I felt I was I was home. That place that I had yearned for, that I that I wanted to be not physically, because physically our body can be anywhere. But yet, yet there's a part of us, all of us, that is 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 got that vibration, that yearning, that 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 ineffable call 
for completeness. And when that's there, the universe, that power cannot but help to come and, and fulfill that desire, that, that, that yearning. It, it, it can't help it. It's almost like, uh, like magnetism. It just, it can't stay away or we can't help but moving toward it or through it or in it. It becomes part of us until there's in the midst of any action that we're taking that, that wholeness, that, that, uh, that, that, that silence, that, that love, compassion, it, it permeates us and we don't think about it anymore because we simply move in it and it simply takes different forms and motions through us. The ego ceases to, to buck the tide, to, to try to go against the current because it's, it's, been, it's been hammered and thinned and, and turned from base metal to gold, if you will. But it, we become that flow. We become that which we, we felt we were missing. Where, where, we, where we were, there was, it, it, we cease to struggle. We cease to struggle. And the yearning takes the form of the completeness of the wholeness of that, mm. that singular beauty that transcends thought, motion. Even stillness is not a right word. It's beyond stillness or movement or anything. And we sit in the middle of it. It's like we're enfolded by it. We merge with it. And from where there was only light in the beginning, then there was this, this form. And at the end, there's only this light once again. That's all there was. It's all there will ever be. All this movement, simply a temporary ripple in that, in that infinite ocean of energy, bliss, intelligence. But the ripple is the ocean. The ocean is the ripple. They're not two. They're just one and the same. That's, that's what was shown to me by Guru Raj more than anything else. And it was that calling from within that simply pulls the universe toward you in ways that the ripple in the ocean can relate to. Though water is just water, two ripples together combining is one, but it's still just the water. And then we realize, oh yes, it's just, it's just a ripple. And now the ripple has subsided and there's just water as it was in the beginning as it is now and ever will be. That's really all I have to say. Thank you, Sujay. Welcome. So beautiful. I, there's a couple more things I would add then since we have a little bit more time. 
How much time do we have? I, I don't keep track of time too much. 10 minutes? Just so I know. Anyway, if anybody 20 knows. Minutos más. Know. What? What? 20, 20. 20. Oh, 20. Okay, thank you. Um, what I wanted to... Sujay, thank you so much. I am... Uh, my whole body is rippling with you in this divine ocean. And I have to say, if you'll pardon me, the sunlight of your being is going through all the waters, waking up every little water molecule and they're all dancing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and what you're demonstrating to me is one of the things I think that I wanna say about what Guru Raj gives us today and always which is the ability or mm, he wakes us. No, he doesn't give us the ability, but he wakes up the ability like that sunshine shining through the water, waking all of the every mo molecule of water charged with joy, light, love, awareness. And as you said, beyond the big eye charged through every molecule that appears for one little moment in this unreality that is the beloved dance of creation, the expression of love. And just a few little things I would like to remind everyone of, I'm sure you all know how Guru Raj used to sing to us. <laughs> well, never mind all the ways he used to sing, because sometimes he would try to sing the way Indians sing and as Americans, we never could quite get it. And we'd go, what? You know, anyway, not that. <laughs> uh, probably the way the flamencos are going to sing in part. Anyway, he used to try to do that. And we Americans, ignorant little dim light bulbs that we were would go, oh no. Actually, I liked it, but a lot of people didn't. Um, but he used to sing he used to say, without you, how can I live, right? Me, and, uh, and he used to sing, oh gosh, I don't know if I want to sing, but it used to go, um, Tere bina mi keseju, meaning without you, how can I live? And he would repeat that. And then he would say, mere dil, tere dil, which means my heart is your heart. So I'm going to sing it and anyone else who wants to join in, nobody can hear you anyway. So uh, I don't care what your voice is like, just throw it in there if you happen to know the tune, okay? Just for the fun of it to acknowledge because this is the heart of the teaching. Literally and metaphorically, the heart is love. And on reality, as he told us a million times, is produced just in order to express the love and the joy, the ananda, that sunlight of what we are, shining through every molecule of the water flowing as Sujay described, that we are. So, <clears throat> I think I, my mouth is dry, so here we go. Pardon the voice. <clears throat> here we go. <clears throat> uh, let's see, how does it go? Oh yeah. <sighs> Tere bina me kese ju. Tere bina ke me kese ju. Mere dil tere dil. Tere bina. Me que se you. Without you, how can I live? Without you, how can I love? Your heart is my heart. My heart is your heart. Without you, how can I laugh? That's my non-translation. And the whole purpose of a guru is simply to awaken you, my beloveds. Oh, and when we get together here, 
And we allow it, as Suje so beautifully spoke about. We surrender that little sense of separation that is so false. It's so funny. It's so paradoxical. We had to have the sense of separation, the false one, speaking as the oneness. We had to have the separation so that there could be a meredil and a teredil to come together and rediscover the beauty that is beyond all form. But we had to break it up. And here we are. Look at us. Look at this gallery of us, all broken up. And yet, just one heart. But we had to do it this way so we could adore and love and take joy. Another thing I wanted to say with my little tiny bit of time left here is I wanted to mention a secret because I heard Guru Raj's voice whisper that while we were uh, here meditating afterwards. And that is, he just wanted to mention the secret, which is an open secret. And that is, every one of you is Guru Raj. Every one of you is a guru. Anyone who doesn't know it yet will know it. And what that means is every one of you is an embodiment of pure love and pure light and pure joy manifested here as these shitronic separated apparently, but not really, as these very funny clowns and lovers that we are. Every one of you is a guru, which means wherever you meditate most of the time and live most of the time, which is all of us right now in our own houses with the pandemic, you are making that an ashram by your vibrations. The way in this, you didn't hear that part, but in this satsang, he talks about, he went to Ramakrishna's ashram and meditated where Ramakrishna used to be. Because Ramakrishna, of course, had died by then, had passed on, not died, but passed on. And he said, the feeling was so deep that without knowing it, he sat in meditation and tears poured out of him. And he didn't even know it till he was leaving and somebody said that tears, that he was crying the whole time. He didn't even know it. And he said, it was no doubt the deep feeling, the true deep feeling of the heart was so moved by the vibration left behind. And he also speaks of, in the part we heard, how you can light the incense in a room and then if later you walk out of the room with the incense stick, the, in, the smell, the fragrance of the incense will be left in the room where it was lit. Every room where you are meditating, you are making it a fragrant with divine love ashram. So there's hundreds of ashrams being awakened. And I wanted to mention also wherever Guru Raj went, he experienced and spread joy the deep joy of, of the heart, the, the whole reason that we're all here in these forms is this joy, this love. And he expressed it so much that total strangers, their faces would open up in radiant smiles, just being around him. Um, every moment was real. Like when Uma gave her satsang and spoke about seeing God in the kiwi fruit, and so forth, seeing the beauty everywhere. And all of you mentioned this one way or another so far, because it's, in all of your satsangs, it's the truth of Guru Raj. Anyway, wherever he went, it was magic. But the magic was because of the awakening within. And so in each of you, as you are awake and do your practices, you bring magic everywhere you go. He saw eternity in every moment of time, which is not eternity. He's, for example, I remember we were walking in Elizabethtown and we were walking into the building where he gave his satsang and the mat, the, the mat on the ground in front of the door, there was a rubber mat with a great big E for Elizabethtown in front of it. And as we were walking into the building, he looked down and he pointed at the E that was in the mat, in the floor mat and said, what is that? And we're looking, well, uh, E, he said, that is E for eternity, everywhere you walk. That's what I mean. Everything he saw, he saw God, as we all do, as we do our 
meditation and spiritual practices. And speaking of spiritual practices, I'm sure you have all learned that he gave us a portion of his own mantra and told us to use it along with our other practices, including our mantra. And I wanna remind you of that. And just, we can say it three times. He said he had a 13 syllable mantra, but he was just gonna give us a little portion of it, which is um, Sham Sharnam. I'm sure you've all heard this, but for those who have forgotten, <laughs> Sham, Sham, is a uh, word that means Krishna, actually. It was one of the, it means a beloved one, or I can't remember all that it means, but basically it's one of the terms uh, that was affectionately used to refer to Krishna, the incarnation of manifest love on earth, similar, identical to Christ. Um, so, and Sharanam means I surrender, like what Sujay was talking about, where we just give up and allow. So sham sharanam is like, I give up and allow, I give myself into the incarnation of love. Let me be also the incarnation of love. Let me surrender myself that I may be like sham, like Christ, the incarnation of love. Let me be, since I'm manifest here in this apparently separated form, I just came so I could be here as the, expression and manifestation of the manifester, which has no form. Every one of you is that. And as you answer the call, as Sujay so beautifully spoke of, the yearning to be one becomes its own fulfillment. And I can say that from experience because of the gift that GR gave me beginning 45 or more years ago. And, uh, uh, I think that's uh, the only other thing I wanted to say in this satsang, which I hope you will listen to because every word is full of sunlight, gold, love, and beauty, and contains a seed that if you plant it and water it, will bear fruit richly. Um, he points out that we have an evolutionary cycle where we go through, we're all going through stages and phases. And it doesn't matter what phase we're on. We just go through stages. And he says, all the stages we go through is just to end back in the circle at the point we began, like the poem of T.S. Eliot, you know, uh, like that line in the poem, which I, I, in the end, we come back to where we started. Some of you actually know what that is. I used to know it, but I don't remember it now. It doesn't matter. What Guru Raj pointed out is, we're always here all the time. And all we do is come back. And how, as Sujay put it, we surrender. Sham Sharanam. So I want to encourage you to uh, use Sham Sharanam on a regular basis whenever you feel like it. It's very beautiful. And, uh, and that's, that's about it, as far as I know. Thank you very much. All of you, thank you all. Keep uh, uh, keep charging up those uh, those little ashrams you're living in, <laughs> and spreading uh, spreading love wherever you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. My dog walker is here now. I have to go get my dogs. How's that for ordinary life? Oh, let me just say, GR said, if you really want to be yourself, be extraordinary. So I am definitely extraordinary. I'll tell you that much. <laughs>